Welcome to Connect Church. I'm Nate Robenstein, lead pastor, and as Elizabeth said, we're really, really grateful that you're spending some time with us today on Easter. Hope you have a great celebration with your family and friends after this, but thanks for spending some time with us this morning as we remember what this holiday is really all about. About six years ago, um, I was, had finished up my morning run. That's back when I was a runner, and now I'm a jogger walker, but anyway... I was uh, finishing up my morning run, and it was about mid-morning mid on a Saturday. I'd gone quite a few miles, and so I was pretty worn out. And um, <clears throat> I was sitting at my kitchen countertop eating the breakfast of champions, you know, and my doorbell rang. Now, you know, about 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, what is it? You know, it's, it's, uh, it's somebody selling something right. It's somebody, you know, trying to get you to come to their church or whatever it might be. And, uh, but when I opened the door, I was shocked to see who was standing there. Standing in front of me was a, a guy who's a, over six foot tall, I don't know, six, two or three. Uh, a young man that I knew because he'd been dating my daughter for about a year. But he lived in South Dakota, in, in Sioux Falls to be exact. And I'm like, Andrew, what in the world are you doing here? He didn't tell us he was coming. He didn't know if we would be home. He didn't call. He didn't text. He didn't even know, my daughter didn't even know he was there. In fact, he lied to her about where he was. He told her that she, he was in Minnesota. And about the time I said, Andrew, what in the world are you doing here? It dawned on me what he was doing there. I'd been through this once before already. A little bit different scenario, but I'd been through this once before already. And of course, he was there to ask my daughter's hand in marriage. And how could I say no after he drove all that way? <laughs> Smart guy, this Andrew. I did tell him, I said, you know, this, uh, this thing about lying to my daughter, this is a one-time exception. I will not stand for that. If you can assure me that that was just for this occasion, uh, we'll be all right. So I don't know if you've ever seen somebody in a context where you weren't expecting them, or somebody showed up in your life in a way that surprised you like that, but I imagine none of our surprises in situations like that would compare at all to what Mary Magdalene felt when she saw Jesus, when she was surprised by Jesus at the tomb. And that's the story from John 20 we're going to look at this morning. Now, we know this story. It's a very familiar story. But let's kind of back into it a little bit, and let's make sure we understand what's going on. Mary Magdalene came to the tomb that day, and she was confused. She was confused because her Messiah had died. And it, it was not just her Messiah, but it was the Messiah of the disciples and the crowds and the people that on Palm Sunday, or what we now call Palm Sunday, were shouting, uh, glory to God in the highest, and Hosanna. All these people had this idea in their mind, based on a lot of really good evidence, that Jesus was special, unique, and powerful, the Messiah. I mean, he was healing people. He raised, as we talked about last week, Lazarus from the dead. And now he was, he was dead. And, and can you imagine sort of Mary's confusion? Like, you couldn't, you couldn't stay alive? I mean, you raised someone from the dead. I mean, Mary was confused. And then when she got to the tomb, her confusion took another turn and increased as well. Because when she got to the tomb, she at least was hoping to see a dead Messiah. But the, she got to the tomb and there was no Messiah. The body was gone. So her confusion went to another level. And, and she was like, I, 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 I can't even grieve him properly now. L let alone all my dreams and hopes about who he was going to be are gone but now I can't even grieve him properly because even my dead Messiah is gone. So when she saw Jesus alive, as we'll get to in a moment, and spoiler alert, we know that happened, right? So, but when she saw Jesus, she was shocked. In fact, she was so shocked, she had a hard time even believing it was true. And so this morning, we want to look at that. And, and I want to just sort of have a statement that we kind of explore this morning. And that is this, that Jesus sees our confusion and he offers us resurrection. That Jesus sees our confusion and he offers us resurrection. So I wonder if, if we can, before we go into the story, if we can put ourselves in this story and, and ask this question, do any of you ever have confusion in your life? Let, 
I, I don't mean like you can't find your way home or you, you, know, you forget people's names. I, uh, that confusion exists, right, for all of us at some level. But I'm talking about the confusion of life not going the way you thought it was going to go. Like, can anybody relate? Like, is any, did anybody sit down when they were, let's just pick an age, let's say 12. And you decided, this is how my life's going to go. And you mapped it all out. And so far, at whatever age you are now, you're on complete track with what you mapped out. I mean, we all have these things in our life, right? These things that happen where life takes a turn and a twist and a, and a crisis and, and, and a death and an unwanted divorce and an and one, unwanted health issue and an unwanted financial burden and, and, and even good things, right? Surprises can come in. Like our life doesn't go and we get confused. And if Mary found something in the resurrected Jesus that was helpful to her, perhaps those of us who have that confusion in our life might find something as well. When our expectations don't line up with our experiences, life can get confusing. So let's see what we can learn from Mary. So John chapter 20, if you have your Bibles, you want to open that up. Uh, if you have, there's some chair Bibles among some of the chairs below and the chairs in front of you. Uh, you can, it'll also be on the screen. So don't worry about it. But if you'd like to follow along in your Bible on your phone or your app, or however you want to do that, we're going to be in John chapter 20. We're going to be at verses 11 through 17. That's page 1052 there those chair bibles and but while you're turning there getting ready let me, let's just get that story context going a little bit now jesus had died as i've already mentioned and mary magdalene and other women had gone to the tomb to finally kind of finish the embalming process and to sort of grieve jesus death this is a very difficult time for them so they went to the tomb to have that moment with jesus and they saw that the stone had been rolled away and the confusion came now you, you, we all know the story well enough and know the burial sort of procedures in those days that the stone would be rolled in front of a cave, in front of a hill, and there would be, uh, the, the grave would be behind that stone. And, and, you know, the body would be in that grave until it sort of decayed and then the bones would be collected and, ke and kept somewhere else. But Jesus' body was supposed to be there. And when, when Mary got there, the stone had been rolled away. And we say, yay, the stone was rolled away. We write songs about it, right? But that's not how Mary felt when she saw it. Because when she saw it, she assumed grave robbers. She assumed somebody has taken his body for some reason. And so Mary was not at all excited about this. It created the confusion. So she goes back and gets the disciples. And Peter and John run ahead. And they go into the grave. And they go inside the tomb. And they look. And they see the linen cloth lying neatly there in the grave. And they note that that's different than what they would think if grave, grave robbers had come. You know, they would think that it would have been disheveled. And, 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 or, or there would not be there at all. But here's these strips of linen that the body had been wrapped in laying neatly. And that caught their attention. And the Bible says that they believed. But they still did not understand. What the Bible, what, what, the, what the scripture said about the resurrection, that Jesus must raise from the dead. They believe, but they didn't understand. Can anybody relate to that? Like, if you can't relate to that, I'm not sure you're really believing. I, I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> because the story we believe as Christians is pretty crazy. We believe God became flesh. We believe he, he I don't want to be, like, weird, but he came to this earth through the birth canal. That's what we believe, that the creator of the universe, that's how he came and we believe that he died in our place. And so this story that we believe can kind of be confusing. And sometimes we believe it. We know it's changed our lives, but we don't always understand it. And so Peter and John were kind of in that place. And Mary was confused. And Peter and John believed but didn't understand. So it's, I, would, I, would, I would say that's confused. They were a bit confused as well. And so that's where we pick up the story in verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white. Again, we say, angels! And they were like, no, angels were oftentimes bringing news that would scare people. Like, we get excited. Angels, no, this was probably like, oh, more confusion. Two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They, were cry they, they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. She did not realize that it was Jesus. The, 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 the man that she had seen as the Messiah, that she had worshipped as the Messiah, that she had put her hopes in for uh, setting up the kingdom of God on earth, she didn't recognize this man that she had seen multiple times. You know why? I think it's because she was in deep grief. Have you ever been in such deep grief that life doesn't sort of, it gets confusing and hazy and you don't remember things? If you've gone through deep grief, you'll, you'll remember there's times of, like, you don't even remember that week or that month in your life. And Mary was going through this deep grief, and she didn't realize that Jesus was standing there. And, and so, so before we get into the story of the resurrection that, that changed the world, we have to get into the grief 
and the confusion that Mary felt in this moment. And I want to take a little bit of a caveat here because, because I want you to know that at Connect Church is a part of the Wesleyan denomination. We believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And, and so because there's some people that say, you know, this group of nobodies, and that's really what they were without Jesus. We would not have known of Peter and John and James and Mary Magdalene and Judas and all the characters. We would not have known it. They would have been fishermen that just went through the annals of history that we would have never known. They were nobodies. And there's sort of a, there's sort of a line of belief that these nobodies had sort of a collective group epiphany about the teachings of Jesus. And that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, but sort of the teachings of Jesus rose up in their spirits. And they all kind of got together and they thought, you know what, Jesus really was something special. And so let's, let's, let's resurrect his ideas. And, and, and let's use that idea to change the world. And George Weigel disagrees with that understanding, and I agree with George Weigel. George Weigel says there's no accounting for the rise of Christianity without weighing the revolutionary effect on these nobodies of what they called the resurrection. They encountered one whom they embraced as the risen Lord, whom they first knew as the itinerant Jewish rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, and who died an agonizing and shameful death on a Roman cross outside of Jerusalem. And he said, and from that encounter, a long list of positive outcomes has occurred. Weigel is saying, listen, they saw Jesus as this rabbi who rose from the dead, and that is their, when they saw him alive, that's what empowered them. That's what empowered them to change the world. Here's some of the things that that group of people did. They gave a new dignity to women in contrast to the culture around them. They did that not as a campaign, not because they got together and strategized, but because they believed the risen Lord. And the risen Lord, who did he speak to first? A woman. And when they saw that, and they saw the dignity that Jesus gave women, because the Lord was alive, they began to give dignity to women. They began to raise them in the social stratus. They had a self-denying health care that provided, uh, 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 they provided care to those who suffered from the plague. When no one else would, who stepped forward to help those in need when the plagues hit in Rome? It was the people who believed that Jesus rose from the dead. You know why? Because they weren't afraid to die. Because they believed that Jesus, who we follow, has risen from the dead. And he promised that we too would rise in life with him. And so it was, that, it was not an idea that, hey, we should be like Jesus. It was like, we saw Jesus, so we should be like this. <laughs> with something deep within them because of what they experienced. They began to focus on the family and, and, and growing the healthy families. They were willing to embrace dying as martyrs. Not because of an idea that, well, Jesus taught us how to love one another, so we should die for that. No, it's because they saw the risen Lord and they knew the risen Lord. They lived as if they knew the outcome of history itself. Weigel suggests that the social changes that followed Good Friday occur only if they actually believed in the resurrection of Jesus. And I would concur with him. And, and, and they all, and the other thing about that is they, they all kind of had the same story. Like, have you ever tried to tell a lie and get a group of people to go along with you in that lie? I know none of you have. I've done that before. Junior high, I mean, I haven't done it for a long time, but. And when you try to do something like that, eventually somebody breaks, especially when it costs them something. But this group of people, they never broke. They never came off. I'm talking about the intimate ones, the ones that hung up, the disciples in this, this small group. They never broke. They never changed their story. And so, so we believe that, we believe that these nobodies changed the world because they saw Jesus. And let's focus it back now to Mary. Let's come back to the heroine of this story it's before mary encountered jesus she was a nobody that was disabled by her grief so grieving that she couldn't even recognize the one she was looking for but after she encountered jesus she became a part of a revolution of love that changed the world but i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit because she hasn't recognized jesus yet in the story so let's get back to the story we know she's going to right you've read the story but let's get back to it jesus asked her a question in verse 15 woman why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking he was a gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. In the uh, Connect Church, we've been going through a series called Visible. You saw the bumper video where we asked the question, where we're looking at the questions that Jesus asked people in the book of John, questions that sort of drew them out and made them visible where others saw them as invisible or didn't see them as visible. You can't see someone as invisible. Think about that. But Jesus made them visible because he saw them and gave them dignity and, 
and, and here's another example in the question this morning, woman, why are you crying? That's, 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 a, that's a sermon in itself, but the second question that I want to focus in is, who are you looking for? Jesus asks Mary, before he reveals himself, before Mary recognizes her, who are you looking for? Well, if Mary were to answer that question, she would say, I'm looking for a dead Messiah. Like, like what I want right now is to be able to grieve the one who I thought was the Messiah, the one who I thought was going to change everything. And I've lost that, but who Mary was looking for in that moment was, was just a body that she could grieve and mourn over and do what needed to be done for a body in that culture. And when Jesus... But what she found was Jesus who surprised her and transformed her life. She found the resurrected Lord. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around and cried out to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. I preached on this several years ago, and I talked about how when Jesus said her name, reminds us what John says in 10, John 10, 10, that Jesus knows his sheep by name, and his sheep recognize his voice. And here's Mary, when Jesus says her name, all of a sudden, she recognizes Jesus. And this, in this moment, is when her confusion becomes resurrection. She doesn't have all the answers yet, right? Like, there's still a lot of questions in her mind. I'm sure she didn't, like, figure out her whole theology of Jesus. But in that moment, what she had been looking for was standing right in front of her, and she recognized that this person, Jesus, is alive. And it took, it took the early church a long time. In fact, we're still trying to figure out exactly what it means that Jesus is alive, but when we encounter Jesus, we know that he is alive. And in this moment, Mary's confusion turned into re resurrection. Jesus was alive and standing not on the porch like my son-in-law, future son-in-law was, but in front of the very grave that could not hold him. And the early church began to process this. And Paul began to write about this. And as the early church began to say, what does it mean that Jesus is alive? They kind of they settle on, I mean, what, they, they kinda, you can see kind of two things that that the other church really grasp about Jesus being alive. First of all, they began to understand that if Jesus is alive, that means that his death on the cross was not just an accident, but that it was a part of a plan. And, then, and, that when, and they began to think about that, and they began to think about the things Jesus said about, and they began to think about the Old Testament history of the Passover and the Passover land and the blood over the doorposts, and they began to process, oh, oh, I see now Jesus was saying that He's going to die in our place and he's going to absorb all the evil of the world so that he can give us all of God's love. And when you begin to read the Apostle Paul, many of his writings are about processing what it means that Jesus' death on the cross, what does the death of Jesus on the cross mean? But you know what? None of that would have mattered if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead. <laughs> if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, he'd just be a martyr who died for a cause, a martyr who died for some ideas of serving one another and loving one another. And culture says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to kill you. And we might have admired him and we might have honored him. We might, but we might not even remember him if he hadn't risen from the dead. And the early church began to process that quite quickly that, oh, his death, excuse me, his resurrection means that his death has validity. And the second thing they processed quite quickly, and again, Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 15 especially, says, wow, if he rose from the dead, and he calls himself the first fruits of the resurrection. They begin to think about the things he said. They begin to look at the Old Testament story and realize there's a Messiah who's coming to establish an eternal kingdom. And it dawned on them that if he rose from the dead, so will we. And so think about what the early church be and what Jesus uh, shows Mary in this moment. And again, Mary didn't get that all in that moment. But the early church, they saw Jesus as the one who has something to say about their past sin. Something good to say that we can be forgiven that we can experience God's love, that, that guilt and shame that we carry around, those things that we try to hide, th those, can be, those can be forgiven and washed. And they begin to think about the sacrifice and what that meant in their life. And, they, and they, they begin to realize that the resurrection means there's something that's being done about our past. And then, they, and then they thought, wow, there's also something being done about our future. Like we don't have to fear death anymore. That's why they could be martyrs. That's why they could not be afraid of being sick when they helped people who were dying of the plague. And they began to think, wow, our past and our future have an answer. And while, again, Mary didn't get all that in that moment, we now can look back and see that that's what the resurrection teaches us. And we should celebrate that. And we should remember that. And I don't want to take anything away from that. But I want to invite you to take the third step that Jesus helped Mary take that day. It's easy to stop there. And to say the resurrection proves that the cross had meaning. The resurrection proves that death doesn't have power over us. Yay, God, celebrate that. That's what we've done this morning. 
But Jesus wasn't done. Notice what he said in verse 17. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Resurrection Jesus was on this earth for about 40 days before he ascended to heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God now, interceding for us. He's on earth for about 40 days. He appeared, depending on how you count it, about 10 times to the disciples, to a small group of people, to a larger group of people, to two people on the road to Emmaus, 10 times. And each one of those times weren't very long. I mean, we don't know for sure, but it clearly was less than a day in all those cases. In many cases, it seems to be like just half an hour, an hour, not very long. So where was he the rest of the time? Why didn't Jesus come back and walk around in the same way he did before he uh, died? Why didn't he come back with the disciples and hang out with him? Why didn't he, like most of us would have done, appeared in front of Pilate? You know, the one who sent him to the cross. It's what I would have done. I would have waited till about three in the morning. (laughs) Pilot, I'm back. (laughs) Why was he gone? He was teaching us something in in his absence. If the resurrection appearance of Jesus proves the validity of the cross and the promise of eternal life, the past and the future, right? What does the resurrection absence of Jesus teach us? There's a lesson here. To understand, let's do a brief review of the iPhone through the eyes of Nate Rovenstein. I was shocked when I asked this question in first 8 o'clock service. How many of you remember party lines? Oh, wow. I don't mean like, some of you are like, party lines. No, that's not, <laughs> that's not what I'm talking about. You know, where you'll call and someone else will be on the lines. Okay, and then, so let's, so, but, and then many of us remember corded phones where you, had to, you were tethered to a spot in the house and then they got those really long cords that would tangle up all the time, right? And then they, uh, the, you know, the, the rotary. <laughs> like, I hated numbers like 979-8894, right? Then the cordless phone came along and we were all set free. We could walk all the way around our house as long as we didn't get too far away from the station. And then I remember the first car phone that I was ever exposed to. My boss, Don Mueller, had it. And Don and I worked, well, I worked for Don in a construction company, and, and it, was, it was a car phone. It was not a phone that he kept in his car. It was a car phone. It had, looked like a kind of a CB radio. That, that had a, I lost to some of you at the CB radio part, but anyway, there's just this thing. <laughs> and, and you had the phone, and the, the horn would honk when Don, like if Don was working, it, the horn would honk if he was working. He'd run to the car, but get the phone before it hung up. And then I remember the first, uh, I guess it's cell phone, but it, it means battery. So, but this, it was this big old battery pack. I don't remember. I saw one in the airport one time when I was flying like in a big city. And this guy had like a battery pack that he hung over his shoulder. It was like this big and his big phone connected with it. And he was like so super cool, man, you know. <laughs> you could tell he was happy to see, show everybody. He's walking around with a phone talking to people. And then flip phones came, and large cell phones first, and then flip phones. I remember the first text that I received. I didn't know what it was. I had this flip phone, and ding, 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 ding. I looked at it, and it said, you have a text. Like, what in the world? What's a text? So I clicked on it, and somebody sent me a message. Actually, it was like a lady that's 10 years older than me. It wasn't some, like, young person. (laughs) And I'm like, what? And she was, her husband was in the hospital, and she told me, she said, you know, Richard is sick. You need to come or whatever. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I've got a And then we get smartphones. These are cool. Siri, what should I preach on today? Interesting question, Nate. That's that's how I prepare my sermons, by the way. That's why they're not very good. (laughs) I keep keep trying. Somebody needs to call Siri and give them some better information. (laughs) And we have the world at our hands. It's amazing. I learn something every day that this thing can do for me, good or bad, right? Now I want you to imagine that I give a smartphone to someone that was stuck at the cordless phone. Somehow, let's let's imagine they lived in a cave and all they had was a cordless phone. That's where their technology stopped. And we're not going to judge these people this morning. We're just going to imagine, all right? Let's imagine that's where their technology stopped. 
and, 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 and I gave them, imagine I gave them this smartphone. But all I told them that, that it could do was make phone calls. Like I didn't give them any instructions and didn't tell them. I said, look here, here's how you make a phone call. And, and they said, you mean I can take this phone and go out there and call? Yes. I can take this phone and go to Missouri and call someone? Yes. I can take this phone and go to China? Yes. I can do it in the... Yes. You can call anyone from anywhere. You can call, any, you can call from anywhere to anyone at any time on this phone. You know what they would be? Amazed. You know what else they would also be? underutilizing the thing they had in their hand. The resurrection should amaze us. We should never, ever get tired of the fact that our past is forgiven and our future is secure. But I want to tell you that if we don't recognize that the resurrection also tells us something about our present, we're walking around with a smartphone and we only know that it can make phone calls. Because of Jesus in this sort of Sort of strange kind of thing. Verse 7, let me read it again. Verse 17. Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus did not have hugophobia. Jesus wasn't saying, oh, don't touch me. Like, you know, some people you might know. <laughs> For visitors, it had to be me. Jesus wasn't afraid of the hug. He wasn't afraid of the touch. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to put Mary, Mary down. He, Jesus was saying, he was commissioning Mary, a woman, by the way, to go to men and tell them the story. And Mary's message was, Jesus must ascend into heaven to send the Holy Spirit to dwell in us so that, we may, that what was inaccessible before has now become accessible. Jesus was saying, I must leave Mary. I can't stay here. I didn't raise from the dead just to hang out with you all. I rose from the dead so that I could ascend to the Father, so that I could send the Holy Spirit who would inhabit each of you who would trust in this story. And it's a powerful, wonderful part of the resurrection we cannot leave. He was simply saying, while my work on the cross is finished, my journey for you is not yet done. Did you notice what Jesus said in verse 17? He said, my father and your father. That was new. Jesus was saying, he's going to be your father now too. And my God and your God, Mary, he's going to be your God. Why? Because I'm sending, I'm ascending to send the Holy Spirit. I haven't come just to hang out with you, Mary, and be your personal little Messiah. I've come to send the Holy Spirit to be the Messiah of all who would accept him. Jesus was saying to Mary, don't hold me back from fulfilling my journey so that you can be united with me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul picked up on this idea. Remember, Paul talks about the past, what the cross did for, did for us, affirmed by the resurrection, and the future, what the cross will do for us, affirmed by the resurrection. But he also talks about the present, Colossians 1. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If Jesus had not ascended, this wouldn't be true. Jesus rose from the dead so that he could go to the Father so he could send the Holy Spirit. He, drove, he rose from the dead to forgive your sins, yes. He rose from the dead to make sure you have a place in heaven eternally with him, yes. But he also rose from the dead to ascend to the Father so the Holy Spirit could change you. Ephesians 3, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. faith. Mike, Mark Galley says the great miracle that the gospel proclaims is not merely that Christ lives bodily after the crucifixion, but that he lives dynamically in us today. He is the, the resurrection proves he is the God of the past and the future and the present through the presence of the Holy Spirit. So who are you looking for this morning? Who are you looking for this morning? A Jesus that will simply forgive your sins and give you a place in heaven, that's awesome, but you're absolutely missing out on all the joys that he has for you. It's possible because of the resurrection, but you have a fully functioning spiritual smartphone. Don't settle up for its calling and texting features only. He ascended and sent his spirit because he wants to indwell you, be united with you, and transform you. If you hear me preach very often, you know that almost every sermon I try to remind you that Jesus can change you. The gospel is not just we're covered by his blood and we have fire insurance for heaven. The gospel is that we're covered by his blood and forgiven for our sins and we have a place with him forever, but that he wants to transform us now. And had he not ascended, that never would have happened. So Mary, who are you looking for? Church, who are you looking for? 
a Jesus that can just take care of your past and future, or a Jesus that can change you now. If you're ready to accept this finished work so you can be fully united with him, we invite you to baptism. As Elizabeth said, we're going to have baptism service next week, next week, and just encourage you to mark that box. We'll send you some information on kind of how to prepare for that. But we hope that many of you will decide to make that step because that step is really an acknowledgement of the fact that I acknowledge I'm a sinner, that my past needs forgiving, that there's stuff I can't resolve. And, and I, you know, it's acknowledging that I, I want Jesus Christ to carry me into eternity, but it's also inviting the Holy Spirit into your life now. And, and you're acknowledging through baptism that you need him to forgive your sins, to indwell you now, and to prepare you for the future. It's very humbling, baptism. It's intentionally that way. You go into the water, you're dying to self. You're, you're saying, I can't overcome these sins. I can't secure my own place in heaven. I can't deal with the condemnation I feel. I need the Holy Spirit. You, d- you die, but you raise in new life. So if you want to participate with us in baptism next week, we invite you to do that. But for all of us, I invite you to remember that the resurrection is not just about our past and our future, but our, about our present. Because he ascended, the Holy Spirit has descended to transform us. So God, we pray that you would do that. We pray that we would be open to your transforming presence in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So prepare our hearts for baptism. Let's watch what happened last time we had baptisms as we prepare to sing one more song after this video.